After Pickett failed to take New Bern and returned to Virginia, General Robert F. Hoke was once again in command. Hoke soon planned an attack on the strategic port town of Plymouth. Union forces had occupied the town since May 1862 and used the site as a major supply depot. About 2,800 federal troops under Brigadier General Henry Wessels defended Plymouth with an extensive system of forts, redoubts, and trenches. Fortifications ran all the way to the northeastern corner of town. In the middle of that line of defense was a very formidable Fort Williams, completely enclosed and uh, complete with bomb shelters for the soldiers in the fort. The eastern end of town was mostly open, protected by a large swamp and a small creek, Conaby Creek, but also by a redoubt, Conaby Redoubt, and a small fort, Fort Comfer. Less than a mile from the western edge of town was Fort Wessels, also known as the 85th Redoubt, because the 85th New York were the ones that constructed it. Fort Wessels was a formidable um, fort in its own right. And then about a mile and a half upriver from there was Fort Gray. And Fort Gray was situated on the narrows of the river and its guns were aimed mostly at the river in order to prevent any gunboats from the Confederacy coming down the river to help Plymouth. Hoke's plans to capture Plymouth involved the use of the ironclad the CSS Albemarle to face off against the Federal gunboats patrolling the area. In preparation for the Battle of Plymouth, Robert F. Hoke was given command of land and water forces by President Jefferson Davis. This was a unique situation. He was the first commander to have and been authorized to be in command of a joint force expedition. Now, there were other joint force expeditions in the Confederacy, but this is the first time he had command of both land and water. Hoke rendezvoused with Confederates led by Matt Ransom and part of James Kemper's brigade at Tarboro a combined force of about 7,000 men. April 17th was the first day of the Battle of Plymouth. When Hoke's forces attacked Plymouth, Ransom's brigade was the first in and deployed to the east of the main road in front of the southern fortifications of the town. Hoke stayed on the main road and invested Fort Wessels, and Kemper's brigade under Terry went off to the west to attack Fort Gray. Clearing the swamp in the wooded area, Terry's men came under a murderous fire from Fort Gray. They soon found out why. There were white markers in the field. At first, the men thought that they were dropped handkerchiefs or surrender flags. Soon they realized that there were targets that had been placed to find range and uh, distance. Facing accurate and deadly cannon fire, Terry and Ransom's brigade that was moving in on Fort Williams abandoned their assaults. At dark, refugees driven into Plymouth in front of the advancing Confederate forces were evacuated. Men, women, children all got on the USS Massasoit and left for Roanoke Island. As the Albemarle had yet to arrive on the scene, Union gunboats were free to shell the Confederates, helping drive off attacks on the Federal fortifications. That night, the Albemarle slipped past Fort Gray and would engage the Federal gunboats the morning of the 19th. As the Albemarle passed Fort Gray, the fort fired upon her. One of the sailors aboard the Albemarle reported that the firing had little effect, much like peas against a tin can. Now, the CSS Albemarle was loose on the lower Roanoke. The Confederate ironclad sank the USS Southfield and drove off the USS Miami and two other Union warships on the scene, and then provided supporting fire for Confederate assaults on the fortifications. On the morning of April 20th, Ransom's brigade attacked the eastern side of Plymouth. There were only two small fortifications there, Fort Canfee and the Canopy Redoubt. Both of those were encircled and captured and then Hoke's men moved into the eastern side of town, following the east-west streets until they reached the western edge of town. Remember, the fortifications were designed to defend the other front, and so were opened on the east side, and thus when his men attacked, they had little choice but to surrender 
the fortifications. Battery were surrendered and most of the redoubts around it. The holdout on that line on the southwest corner was the African Americans and the North Carolina Unionists who were stationed at that location. Most of the southern defenses surrendered except for Fort Williams. The 8th North Carolina charged Fort Williams. They were not authorized to do so and they were repulsed with heavy losses. Wessels had previously rejected demands of surrender, including an earlier attempt by his men to do so. However, heavy shelling from both hoax artillery and the Albemarle finally forced Wessels to cede his stronghold at Fort Williams. Now, some of those men had escaped either just before Fort Williams fell or just after Fort Williams fell to a nearby swamp. They were followed by Confederate cavalry who then hunted those men for the rest of the day. The cavalry did not bring back any prisoners. The number of men executed is debatable. That something happened that day in terms of execution is not debatable. The Battle of Plymouth was the third largest battle fought in North Carolina, and it proved to be one of the last Confederate victories of the Civil War. After Plymouth fell, Union forces abandoned Washington, North Carolina, and they looted and partially burned the town as they left. Hoke was unable to follow up his victories with an attack on Newburn, and he and his men were recalled to Virginia when Union forces threatened Petersburg and Richmond. The Confederates would hold Plymouth until the Albemarle was sunk by raiders in October 1864. 